Oh my God, it's time. Oh my gosh, our first live and video episode. I can't believe it. First of all, I can't believe I'm getting to see you. Hello. Uh, hi, hi, hello. Uh, hey everyone, welcome to our first How to Be More Chill Live. I would love to say I know the episode number. I think it's 13, but it doesn't matter because it's live and video, which changes so it's number everything. number one and 13. Exactly. Oh my God. Um, for anyone who might not know, How to Be More Chill is a podcast about the Broadway and Off West End musical and Chicago productions of Be More Chill, a musical that Alana and I both claim to be super fans of. I was also a producer of the Broadway production, and Alana has incredible podcast interviewing skills. So together we have teamed up to make How to Be More Chill. Alana and I have been chomping at the bit to get some of these London cast members yeah. interviewed. And we are so excited today to tell you that we are bringing in our hero himself, Jeremy here from the London production of Be More Chill. I wore my creep shirt just in case he wants to perform the musical with us yeah. today for Mr. Scott Fullen. Welcome Scott Fullen to our show. Hi. Hi. Oh my God, Hi. you're Thanks here. Yeah, lovely. So, You're in London. London. I am. Yeah. I am in London. I'm. I'm very comfortable. I think. I would say, what's the vibe there? Although, when people ask me, you know, from like my home city of Georgia, what's the vibe in New York? I'm like, I don't know. I can tell you the vibe in my apartment. That's yeah. all I know. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think it's all right here, actually. Yeah. I think. I mean, generally, I can. I can only tell you my yeah the friend groups I talk to, but I think generally morale's morale's not super low. I'll say, I'll say that. I'm, I'm going to say morale's high, but it's not super low like it was at the beginning. Yeah. So have you been quarantining at home? Do you go out at all? What What's your daily life like? So I, I live with my mum and dad and my girlfriend has just moved in with us because she was in a flat around the corner. Um, and she thought, I mean, she was, it was either she came to mine every day, which is you shouldn't be doing, or you right. just become part of my household and then quarantined with us. So she and I do the shopping with full gloves and and mask um and uh and my mom and dad don't really except my dad goes for a walk every day otherwise they don't leave the house and my in fact Kirsty goes for a walk every day and i i don't like walking so i just kind of i play table tennis in the garden that's my exercise ah good yeah. um are you like a homebody at heart is that for some people this is actually not that hard are no, you one of them is, yeah this is heaven for me this is i mean I'm, yeah, I, I'm an introvert as well. So I, I, I've seen so many memes and it was like extroverts when they told stay at home going mental and introverts going, what, so we have to change, do exactly what we were doing before? Right. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, I'm just playing a lot of FIFA, writing a load of songs. Um, I mean, my dad has a home studio. I'm trying to, the, the thing's flipped, it flips. <laughs> So I'm trying yeah, to yeah. no no no. Oh, is, oh, there. My dad has a home studio. Yeah, exactly. It's behind. Yeah. So we yes. we um we just recorded a song. We filmed, we recorded a song and then filmed a music video for it in six hours because we had nothing else to do. So we just well, that's cool. Yeah, it was around. I the tried house. to make a studio in my house, but the furthest I got was this backdrop, and that's it. Oh, it's good. No, it's good. Yeah, it's good stuff. It looks very professional. Yeah. My my ring light is actually locked in a building that can't be accessed until after quarantine is over, anyway. So we've got I mean, my ring light, light and this backdrop. The and, okay, there you go. So lo the London production of Be More Chill was shut down. I think the what the West End was shut down after Broadway, right? Like it a was week, almost yeah. a week or two after, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We were. I mean, actually, I don't know about everyone else, but I, except I obviously did not want to stop doing the show, but we were quite confused why we hadn't. Were your audience getting smaller and smaller as? Actually, no. The last performance we did was was almost sold out. Wow! It was a Do Sunday you night. The day? Um, no, but I know it was a Sunday um, because we the West End closed on the Monday, and everyone okay. else was at work. But Monday was our day off for some reason. We just did Sunday performances. Um, so we, all of our stuff is at the theatre. So you oh, haven't wow. even emptied your dressing room yet? No, we didn't get, we, it's all there. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, I have like quite a lot of clothes there. Um, we had a, I'm not going to name names, but we did have a cast member admit that she left, she, she, I shouldn't even said she, but she left cheese in the dressing room. So there is some, what? Gonna be some cheese. 
some really oh, moldy cheese wow. when we return. But yeah. You know, I was thinking about this. There's probably so many buildings in these big cities that like have like rats in them and stuff. Like if humans aren't in there for weeks and weeks at a time, mm -hmm. like who knows what's going on in some of these buildings, especially yeah. with I'm, I'm gonna, cheese everywhere. I'm gonna assume that the other palace, after you guys left, there was someone in charge of cleaning who may have come in after you because often actors need people to come in after them. Often it's not, always, always is the word. Always. So maybe there is not like a cheese fiasco. Uh, yeah, I don't, think that's, I don't think it was on the floor. I think it may have been in a packet. Um, but, I, but I know for sure that the other palace stayed open for a few days. Okay. They did give us the option to go in, but obviously you then have to travel on the tube. Right. And it, it was just at that time, that was in the height of people being like, I can't, I can't even leave the house. You know, it was for you guys getting so close to the actual Buckingham Palace. Don't want to get the Queen sick. No, 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 no. Well, I think <laughs> I, would, I mean, I I don't know, but I think didn't some there was a rumor that someone in the royal family had it. Prince Charles. Yeah. Oh yeah. He yeah. had it. Um. All right. So we we've started at the end of what was an incredibly thrilling run for the universe. Um. But Sam and I, if you don't mind, we would love to go back in time a little bit to to this question, which is when did these three words enter your brain in any way, shape or form, be more chill? Um, be more chill. I So I had, I would say that I heard, I heard the music on Spotify, like like probably every fan ever heard it on shuffle because of Dear Evan Hansen or Hamilton or something that they were listening to at the time and thought, oh, this is good. I was I must have been on the tube or somewhere with no Wi-Fi. So I just heard it when, oh, that's really good. I saw the artwork of the original car. So it was really colorful, yeah. like nothing you would ever forget. And then it just swiped by and I I never I never heard it again until I got an audition in for it. Saw the artwork when I went to listen to it and went, that was that show that I was like, that sounded great. What is that? Yeah. And I never found it. Um and then I had to learn. I obviously, I, I actually only by chance heard. My screen is flickering. Is yours flickering? No. It is not. Oh, sorry about that. I have That's it. okay. Um, uh, I heard Michael in the bathroom because it was the first song on the audition list for songs you had to learn. But I didn't realize it. I didn't have to learn it. Were you always asked to audition for Jeremy, or did they yeah. ask you to choose a part? So I had a funny audition process because they'd cast the entire show before they cast me. Yeah, so they they came over to London, cast everyone except Jeremy. Um, not by choice. I think they just couldn't quite find someone. They couldn't um, find you. Yeah, and and, and then uh, I sent I sent a tape over to America because um, I don't I, I mean I don't I don't know why I didn't hear about it when they were here, but I heard about it afterwards and and. Uh, they put out a call for self tapes. So I sent a 15 minute tape of me singing like five songs and doing two scenes. It was the longest self tape I've ever done in my life. Um, and well, I, it. But, oh God, yeah. I, <laughs> it, was, it was really funny because that was what we were saying while filming it, because it took so long to film. It was about four hours on a Friday oh. night. So I was I hadn't eaten because I was planning to eat at seven. And I thought, well, we'll film this and I'll eat, it, eat at eight. And obviously, you grossly I grossly underestimate how long it takes to film a 15 minute self tape that includes songs I didn't quite know. Um, so it took four hours and I ate at about 11 o'clock. My stomach was hurting so much. Oh, no. um, but all I was saying was, if I get this, it'll be so worth it. So yeah. worth it. I'll and eat again. I, I, I did get it, luckily. Yeah. I mean, I, Wait, I did you get it off the tape? I got, um, well, apparently I did. So, I mean, I, I believe it was this podcast that told me I did. did you <laughs> I remember, some things, I remember yeah. when we talked to Steven about this. Yeah, because yeah. I listened about... to this podcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for, for people joining us, we have an episode on the How to Be More Chill podcast where Stephen Brackett, the director, goes through all the different London cast members and how it had to be those people. And his uh, love fest about you is is quite apparent immediately. It, hearing it was about very it. fun to listen to, I must say. Um, it was I hadn't heard of it, and then Blake sent it to me and said, "If you'd like an ego boost, listen <laughs> to this." And it was amazing. It was probably one of the greatest nights of my life. Can you wow. tell people who Blake is? 
Oh, Blake played Michael in the London productions. Where he was my that familiar. Yeah. He was my player one, and I was, I believe, I haven't done the show in a while. I, th did I believe. You guys, it, did you guys know each other before no. the show? Okay. Um, we we connected on social media. It was quite an awkward thing because the cast was announced. We met once to take photos, and then we didn't meet for two months. Um, so we had to, it was, there was awk started bits of awkward conversation going, ha ha ha, have you seen this? Ha ha ha, oh, isn't this nice? The, the fans are being so lovely. Um, but then over about two months you, of that kind of conversation, it starts into be more of a friendship. And then I went round to his house for dinner the week before we started rehearsals. Uh, and that was it. That was, and then we started. So we bonded a little bit. But Did you play video games after you went to his house for dinner? Um, we he threatened me with his boyfriend uh, is is a big gamer and he had uh, he had a VR headset and I said I have to play with I've never played I've never used a VR headset and I was like I have to play but then we ended up playing like. Banana Grams, I think. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Which what, what really me and the entire Be Merciful fandom would not give to have footage of Jeremy and Michael, the London Jeremy and Michael playing video games together for the first time ever. Oh, it was amazing. And, uh, banana we and Banana Grams was was but he cooked dinner. He it was he was a phenomenal chef. Yeah. Ja jam oh I can't remember what it's called. It was a chicken dish. Cool. Jam oh. No. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. Wow. It was really nice. Okay. So you send a tape in and mm -hmm. then and then they come to London, the creative team, and then you come in for them directly. Yeah. So I they obviously didn't so in, in your podcast, uh Stephen said that he decided he wanted to cast me. He didn't tell me that. Thank you, Stephen. I so I came in really thinking, oh, I mean, if I get even if this is it, even if this was the end, this would be great, you know. I've I've met I've I've been seen by some amazing people. Yeah. You watch other things and actually think, oh, this you know, even if it get even if it stops here, this would be great. Um, but but they apparently I didn't disappoint. I think that's what Stephen said. He just wanted to come over and make sure I was like real or I hadn't like like uh, auto tuned my voice on that tape or something. Right. Apparently I didn't disappoint and I was cast. So, How long after that day did you find out officially? Um two or three days and only because they were in such a rush because the photo shoot was on the Monday and I'd auditioned on the Tuesday. Wow. So six days they had to tell me, me sign the contract and then agree to do a photo shoot. And so they were literally like, please, please, please just tell us now. Like, hey, get back to us ASAP. <laughs> You're like, well, if you really need to know quickly, I have a few demands I want to share with you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, can you my agent went, a little bit about like that around that time, like you're getting cast, uh, rehearsals are starting, or even in that two month period in between some of the, like, what were your thoughts about the fandom? The fact that they were probably blowing up your phone and all of a sudden your likes, your follow counts going up, you know, it's a, it's a big responsibility. All of a sudden the world has a new Jeremy. Um, can you tell us uh, how that went? Like any, any specific uh, interactions you remember from fans during that time? I, I do remember freaking out because my my phone had never done that before. I've been I've been working. I've been a, an actor since I was twelve, so that's eight years now. And in eight years, I've never been in something that my phone has done that. In my, like, I mean, on that very first day, I did. In fact, I didn't even post anything until I wanted to make sure I was allowed to. Right. Um, I retweeted one tweet from like what's on stage, and my. My Twitter went up 300 followers instantly. Right. And then, but it was my Instagram that, that I'm not going to say exploded because it's not crazy numbers, but compared to what I had before I did this show. Can you share the story of how you found out and what you did when you found out you got the show? Um, it's such a, it's such a London boy. I mean, I, <laughs> like I barely, my life barely changed. Okay. I didn't do any, I mean, my, my agent, my agent was in Italy and she wouldn't let her assistant tell me. She wanted to be the one to tell me. So I had to wait a couple more hours because she was in the Vatican at the time. So she couldn't go on her phone because they they don't let you on your phone. So she was like trying to get signal sneakily. And then she called me. Uh, she like played it down. She was like, oh, just a quick call. And when your agent says that, you think, oh, it's bad news. Um, bad news. Yeah. So I, I readied myself and she went, yeah, you, you got it. And I was like, sorry, what, what? Um, and, and then, then you put the Pope on. 
yeah oh yeah and then he, she handed it over to francis and i was like mate i'm chatting to my age i don't know if you can yeah it's quite important phone call um but obviously i was quite loud so my dad came out and was like like that and i was like and he, and he jumped around and went mental but my mum wasn't in um but and my mum my mum's lovely the most amazing woman in the world but she i op i opened the door and went i got it and she went hey we're going to the bank that so that was <laughs> my first, balance the first thing i did was a, a trip to the bank yeah. nice yeah yeah uh, i was literally i mean i was going like and my mum was like um so i need you to hand this in and then give this over and i'll sign this i was going mom mom i got i'm jeremy here yeah. i don't do this anymore <laughs> well humility humility is important it's true my i mean my parents will i will i don't think i'll ever get to the point where anyone could ever think i'm arrogant or anything like that because my parents will just go like if i start raising my feet off the air they'll be like yeah do the laundry so, do the laundry yeah. sky yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, no, I've spent, so this quarantine i've spent i've learned how to clean a toilet oh. that was i couldn't do that before what else what else um, you, what else is new it's all clean. I mean, it's all cleaning stuff. I learned how to. Yeah. Uh, I did a show last year where I, I, I'd never moved out. I moved. I had to move to Chichester, which is a couple of hours on a train. Um, and I did over three months. I did two washes of clothes. <laughs> wow. Um, right. I, uh, so that's what I learned. I learned. Yeah. Okay, so you're the first rehearsal starts. Can you tell us about that day, that first rehearsal? And oh, one quick question is. You know, actors have differing opinions on what they like to do in these situations. Were you like listening to the cast recording and, and researching it, or were you like, no, 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 I don't want to listen to that and go into rehearsal cold? So the the first day was absolutely incredible. Um, uh, we it was super nerve wracking. But I, so, but I was one of the. I am one of those actors who over researches. I do. So I listen to every instead of doing like I don't want to copy anyone, so I won't listen to anyone. I do. I'll listen to everyone who's Got done it. it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, watch. I watched. Um, the fans will be pleased to know. The first thing I did was consume every bit of meme content about the show possible. So I typed in "Be More Chill" into uh, YouTube and went through every single upload. I can. I must have consumed about twelve to thirteen hours of "Be More Chill" meme content just to understand, because the, fa the fans understand it better than anyone. Yeah. I mean, I could, you know, I could have a long, long intellectual conversation with the two Joes for hours, but get more from a fan in five minutes. Yeah, especially for this show, I feel like for for be more chill specifically, mm. the fans run this show. The fans, oh, yeah. fans are what this show is. So yeah, that's, that's so really clear cool that that's. I what wanted to know what the show was like from their perspective, so that's what I did first. Um, then I I did listen to both soundtracks about thirty five times each. Um, and uh and and then and then i went through we weren't allowed to see the script uh because oh. it was a new a new west end script so way, what were the changes there's quite a lot there was quite a lot um well i mean the story doesn't drastically change but there were definitely loser geek whatever was a was was drastically different um it was almost almost a london version it was a whole nother almost a whole nother song because uh, it cut out a bit in the middle, added a bit to the end. Uh, it was it, it, the shape of the song totally changed, uh, wow. and then uh, bits were taken out, taken out, bits were added in. So there was quite a lot of changes that they they just hadn't hadn't put in a full script yet. So we got the Broadway version. So I we were, we were researching and listening to the the both cast recordings. Um, were there American references that you didn't understand or? Do you remember any of them? Yeah, we took quite a few out. So obviously, yeah, because you have a London audience uh -huh. and and we had an American director. So they wouldn't have known, like Stephen and Joe wouldn't know what we wouldn't know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, right. So they yeah. did a lot of like in the read through, They, I could see them when the American jokes came up, they would sit there and go, is anyone laughing? Right. Anyone? No one's laughing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Hot Pocket, we had to change to Pop-Tart because it is an American show, so it has to be an American thing. Sure. But no one in England knows what a Hot Pocket is, but everyone knows what a Pop-Tart is from Friends and How I Met Your Mother and things like that. Um, so that, that yeah, Mr. Reyes says um, he needs a Pop-Tart rather than a 
rather than a, a hot, hot pocket. pocket. You didn't know what a hot pocket was. No, I would never have known. I still don't. I don't think I do. Do you know right. what Pink Fairy is? N no. Is that a frozen yogurt shop? Yes. Oh, okay. So when Brooke and Chloe, so do they not say Pink Fairy anymore in the London? They do, room? because it's kind of, I only know that because it, it's kind of, the, the line before is like, we need to stop and get frozen yogurt first. Right. So you kind of assume it's either a flavor of frozen yogurt or a shop. And I don't think, I, because that was a sung line, it's much harder to change. Sure. Right. Sure. Well, yeah, pink berry in New York, we had them do a, a special Be More Chill flavor. There's a pink berry location only two or three blocks from the Off Broadway Theater and the Broadway Theater. And they did one with a, a cup and everything. I might be able to, to step off camera and dig it oh. out for a second and show you guys. Uh. Um, actually, no, it's in the box that's holding my computer up, so we can't do that, but it was very cool. <laughs> very professional studio. Yeah. Um, so did they yeah, start no. you off, were you um, doing music rehearsal first? Yeah, so we learned all the songs. The first two days of rehearsals were um, song, it was like a song workshop. Um, two days, two full, like, I think it's 10 hour days of songs. Um, and then we did a full it was so that we could do a read through, sing through as well, a rough sing through, read through, um, where apparently I, and I'm not a very experienced actor. I'm only 20, so I'm very young. I haven't been to drama school, which means when it comes to a read through, I think that means go all out and do your, and so I like almost stood up to, <laughs> to sing the opening. And then you're like, oh, 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 oh we're not doing I like, it. Yeah, yeah, it was. But then when Lose the Geek Whatever came around, I was proper like, I like sat like this on my seat. I was like fully up. Um, and someone, I think I heard someone talk about it on social media or an interview or something. And it was like when Scott got up halfway through the, through the first um, first read through, we all kind of went, oh, so it's like that. And then everyone kind of like stepped up, which is nice. Yeah. It, it meant that everyone, everyone had to be like. They were like, Scott, yeah. relax. Yeah, relax, mate, relax. <laughs> What my theory is that a good drama school would teach you to embrace those instincts as opposed yeah. to anyway, get up yeah. if you do during the reading. That's I cool. have a feeling you could teach at drama school, actually. You might be able to go right to that and, and skip the classes. Did you know anyone in the show? Did anyone already have a connection with each other? Well, there were two. Millie and Renee knew each other because they did six. They didn't do it together, but all of the... It, there's only six girls in six. Uh, which, which is why it's called six. Yeah. Um, so they're quite they're quite aware of all of their existences. Everyone who's played that role is quite, especially early in the, I think Millie was in one of the first, the first or one of the first, and yeah. then Renee was in the official cast recording. Oh. So they, they they knew of each other. Okay. Um, so but everyone else I think was. Was new to each other. Right, yeah. So did they do anything, did Brackett or, or the Joes, was there any sort of like, let's hang out outside of rehearsal and bond a little bit as a company or did it all happen in the room? It, we, I think we all kept threatening to take him to Nando's and then he never came with us. He never, I think he went once with someone and hated it. So he never, Nando's is like Portuguese chicken. Okay. Like, it's like, I was going to say spicy, but you can, the idea of it is you go in and you say, I want medium or hot or extra hot. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's quite a, it's Portuguese, but it's quite a British thing. Um, it's really nice. It's it's all like, if you come to England, you have to go to Nando's. Did you feel a kinship? I mean, Jeremy here is an incredible part and everyone relates so deeply to that role because everyone has had a time in their lives where they just felt like loser geek, whatever would, would apply to them in some yeah. way. So how, how were you as a kid, a teenager, like you, you're, it's wonderful because you still were a teenager playing this role, not in high school anymore, I assume, but no. um, how are you and Jeremy connected as characters? As um, humans, I should say. Well, I, yeah, I, I felt so blessed. Uh, it's it's it was definitely I can say without a doubt the best thing I've ever done. Mm. Um, oh. It is the closest to me a character's ever been because I did a lot of I mean I'm doing it now 
um, the Jeremy here thing. And I've started doing it in real life because I did it so much on stage, which is just like nervously picking your nails and and just a lot of like, do you know what I mean? Things we shouldn't do now, touch your face, but um, a lot of little things because I did those things. Kicks. Yeah, because I yeah. did those things in secondary school. I was heavily bullied and outcast and all those things we all were as creative people in school. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I was so lucky that I could just go, oh yeah, I'll just use that then. Great. Sick. That's that sorted. You know, that's that scene. Oh, great. Yeah. I did. Oh, I know I went through that. So, and I found myself doing that with every scene going, oh, okay. This character is just basically me when I was 16. Oh, wow. okay, great. Sorted. Was it painful to revisit or was it like, were you ecstatic to be able to use it in this, in this new way? Oh, that's a beautiful question because I think it was both. Mm. I think, um, it, it, I did a lot of crying, and I'm not quite. I'm not actually prone to crying. I'm quite. I'm. I'm quite an emotionally distant person, so I. I'm quite good at just going like, eh, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, that's the way it is, isn't it? Um, but I did. I found myself because Jeremy is the like me. He's quite an emotionally distant person, but some things would make him cry. There are just a lot of a lot of similarities between us. So, Loser Geek, whatever. The first time I sang it, I I wept like a baby um yeah. and there were there were shows that i would go off stage and cry sometimes because i felt like i hadn't done a good enough performance but sometimes mm -hmm. because i'd i'd gone so far into it that um, you released something yeah in yeah and then the second half would mean something so totally different because i never i'm one of those i'm one of those there there's not many words to describe it that aren't rude one of those actors who who says oh i don't act i be i be the character um, so five minutes before a show, I would, I would become Jeremy. So I would, no one would talk to me and I would just think the thoughts and then walk on stage. And then for that entire show, wouldn't leave it. I might, if I, in an emergency have to answer a question backstage, I wouldn't do it in an American accent, but I'd try and stay within the world of being more chill, even backstage. And, and, uh, the interval for me was, it would happen sometimes depending on whether I cried from losing geek or whatever. Um, at the interval, you felt like you could connect with other castmates. Like, what happened at the interval? It, it it totally depended on on if how Act One went. Yeah, yeah. So if Act One went really badly, and I in my head wasn't in Jeremy, I wouldn't be it as I walked off stage, and I'd complain, be like, "Oh, that was rubbish," to other cast members, and um and connect with them. Um, but mostly, I would connect between shows because I like to get changed stand backstage or get changed, sit on my dressing room desk and, and just head down, wait for the five and walk. Um, yeah, I say five. Uh, people in my cast, would, I went at beginners. I, I was there, not there early. I would, at the time in which I should be on stage, I was like walking to get there. Okay. Yeah, no. I had to, but I have an excuse. No, no, no I'm normally really good. Management. No, normally I'm really good. But in the interval of that show, I have to peel on a, a Halloween costume. Mm. which yeah. takes 15 minutes. Yeah. So that I, I, have, I had an excuse on that show. Normally stage managers listening are very good. <laughs> I mean, I also know just from the Broadway production, like how intense act one is for Jeremy specifically. Like Jeremy doesn't leave the stage in act one. Um, you get a little time off in act two, but like- it is in, in act one, it's 45 seconds I got off stage. Oof. Man. Yeah, it's like opera. It's like it's an opera. It's. It's like a long aria in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Sam had a really good, we were talking before and, and we both love knowing about this stuff. Did you, cheese aside, did you guys share a dressing room or did everyone have their own? How did that work? We, um, I try, I mean, I, I tried and tried my best to get the other boys chucked out. <laughs> um, but no, we had, we had to share. It was boys, boys and one, girls and the other. Cause we didn't have any, I've done a show at the other palace where there were children in the cast and there are only two dressing rooms. Okay. So we had to do a girls, a kids and a boys, which meant the boys were shoved into the green room upstairs, mm -hmm. which is this tiny cramped kitchen. Um, but luckily there weren't any under, I think it's 12s can't share, or um, probably under 16s. Um, there, everyone was over so we could just do boys and girls. Um, yeah, no, as I say, I, I did... I did fight for the contract to say that I had my own dressing room, but they they wouldn't have it. You're like, you want me at that photo shoot? Green yeah, you know what I need. So, but they wouldn't they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't oh, do wow. it. 
next yeah. time. Yeah. What was your prep for the show? Did you have a, like rituals or things you had to do every single night? Did it evolve uh, uh, during the run or what was your prep? I, I mean, for me personally, it was only st um, standing backstage. I would, I would obviously do the checks of my props and, and everything was in place and I, my water bottle was full. Cause as I say, in, I only have 45 seconds. And part of that 45 seconds is stage management shoving a water in my hand, me downing it as I walk across the back of the stage, giving it to a stage manager and walking on stage. Mm -hmm. So that water bottle had to be full. So it was that, it was the props, and then it was standing backstage for about two to three minutes. No one would talk to me. And it wasn't, I didn't ask anyone not to talk to me. I actually had a really nice moment on one of the first days where Renee and Millie noticed that I was doing this and would stop cast members talking to me because they could mm -hmm. see, because I'm one of those polite people who would just, I wouldn't be like, oh no, I, I, can you not talk to me? I'd just be like, right. oh, okay, okay. And yeah. then- um, And did, did, did that shift and become a little less intense as the production went on or no? Like as you, no, as you settled into no. the role, I see. I am so in love with that part of acting that I, I, I would sit at home going, can't wait for that two or three minutes where I, you know, that's, like I crave that, so I would do that. And also the sad thing being that we didn't do it for long enough. Right. right. That that I don't think. I think maybe later in the run that may have may have gone. But there were also little things like Blake would um, Blake who played Michael every day would wash his hands before a um, before a performance. I don't know whether he'd been to the toilet or just liked washing his hands. Um, but then he would come up to me and and because I'm topless at the beginning, he would just do that on my back and front and i'd literally be like because he'd had freezing cold hands from washing his hands and he'd do that every, before every show two two on a matinee day um there I he feel is like that's cool though too because it's like a little bit of just like getting into character with the relationship of jeremy and michael yeah as well. yeah, yeah yeah it does it, and that, that straight from that i'd go into thinking jeremy thoughts so in my head that was michael doing that i love it, was it. really nice it, it, he wasn't doing that for that but i'd use it i started right. using it can you tell us a little bit about um, that first preview? Um, did you did you feel all my jealous energy from New York that I wasn't there, and and how the the entire world we we love first previews at Be More Chill because obviously for Opera Way it was the first time the show had been put up in two or three years after this whole fandom had built. First preview on Broadway is obviously a giant deal, and I yeah. know that you know m at least more than half of that audience on that first night were there for a very specific reason to be at that first preview. Yeah. Um, what was it ele as it electric as I imagined it to be? Um, it was really scary. Okay. So the the electric is the total right word for the audience who were watching the show, um, but for us, I've never been so scared going out and doing the show. It was the most incredible feeling of my life. Going out that first moment, everyone obviously knew it was coming. They didn't necessarily know I would be topless because I, I don't think Will is at the beginning. I think he no, did. No, we just said that a few months ago. I was like, whoa. That's yeah. Crazy. So I, so I, I do no top instead of no trousers because we don't. We didn't have a bed in our production. We had a, a desk. So I was my sleeping was head down on the desk, um, just because we had a slightly smaller stage. We staged it slightly differently. Um, uh, so I I did a top on and then the cardi and that was my change at the beginning. Uh, so that first night when I when the lights came up and I was topless, I could feel that energy of oh this is slightly different to what we know. Yeah, that was it was both is trepidation the right word which is and but also excitement for like oh we're not about to watch the same thing. This is actually going to be something fresh and new, which is nice that I think. Whether Brackett did that, obviously it was a deliberate choice, but whether he knew that was going to happen or not, that was the that was the response I felt straight away. But the 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 most scary part was walking out after the show. Because we were warned. We were warned about how many people would stay. Yeah. Um, and they did. Oh yeah. I've and again, as I say, I've never been I've never done anything in my life where anyone has wanted to talk to me after something I'd done. No one has ever asked for my autograph. No one has ever. The, the only time I've had my autograph asked for was when I did a show with James Nesbitt. Um, and I, w I was playing his son and I walked out after the show with him. And a lot of people were asking for his and I was standing next to him. Someone kind of went, like handed me the book, like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, you may as well sign it. Yeah. And I was like, I know what's going on here. 
I'm just I mean, waiting. Touring in general, I think, is not as as big of a thing in London, but we knew going into the London production of BUNHL that no matter what, um, I mean, luckily the other palace had had Heathers and knew that, like, you know, there was going to be a stage door, but it's not but, surprising at all that, like, the, we, we were surprised even off Broadway. Off Broadway was, you know, a 300 person theater, I think, similar to the other yeah, palace. Yeah, that's what the other palace had, yeah. Nights the stage door was like 200 plus people. Yeah. And, so, like, you know, we didn't have a stage door. Right, same thing at, at, at the Opera Way production at, yeah. um, uh, in New York. Then you went to the lobby of your yeah. theater. Yes, and it was just the front door. A long line, right? Yeah, but we, but they the other palace hadn't really, although they told us they've had it before and they knew what they were going to do, I don't think they quite had it like Be More Chill. Mm. And when 200 people are in a lobby, it was, it was carnage. It was... <laughs> It was absolute. I mean, I, from about three days in, they formed a line, and then the line went outside about two weeks into the run, um, which was slightly more. I always did you stage door. I'm going to call it, but we didn't have one. Um, I always said hello to people afterwards, um, but that first night was. It was just like people just did like came came up to to us because we all kind of walked out as a group, wow. not knowing what to expect. And we were rock stars. The security team literally were like, "I'm washing my hands of this. I don't know. I've I can't. I got no. I got literally. <laughs> I can't smell the for yourself. Yeah. Right. So, like so I have my theories, and Sam has his theories, and there will be volumes written about why this show at this moment in time has kind of permeated the culture in such a beautiful way. But I'm wondering. Like, what do you think it is that is so unbelievably universal? Because in New York, and I'm sure this was true too, many adults found the show equally moving and hilarious and fulfilling. Even if kids brought them there, they, mm -hmm. they found themselves completely enamored with everything about it. So can you speak to that from, from inside the experience and what it felt like to you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just know how wonderful it felt doing it, mm. um, and how how blessed I was to um, to join the family, uh, and and yeah, I mean the the I think the 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 beauty of the show and the beauty of what the Joes have done is not the show is for young people by young people because young people play the parts. I'm not necessarily saying that, that Joe and Joe are, I don't know how to put that. They're, I wouldn't call them young people, but- They're not teenagers anymore. No, they're not teenagers. But the, the <laughs> when the, I'm also going to say when the actors who originated it in America, they I'm sure they were quite young when, they, when the whole journey of it started. So it molded around young people, but it doesn't talk down to young people. And it doesn't say, oh, look at us. We're a bright, shiny, bubbly musical for young people. Mm. It's- um, it's a raw uh, exploration of what it's like to be a teenager. And, and it's so true and it's so, um, it's so beautiful as well as taking the mick. Mm. It, it absolutely rips apart everything you do as a kid and everything you do as a teenager. Um, and it, it centers around this, this, I I I always say he he's not although the song loser geek whatever he's not a loser you know he is just smack bang in the middle he's that mm. normal nobody that that everyone always felt like they were whether they were that in reality or not everyone at one point has always felt like oh nobody likes me no, sure. there's, there's no you know there's no point because nobody likes me even even if they're sitting in a group of people they're going to be like no they don't want me here they I mean I'm just here they just felt bad saying no, so I'm here. Like that's why I'm at this. So Did that's you have a, a squip experience. I mean, squip has come to mean so many things for mm. so many people, and obviously, the the moral of the show is you, you are your own squip, right? Like you have to be your own voice. But yeah. But in your Teendom, did you have like a squip moment where you saw an opportunity to be somebody else and you took it? Yes. Did yeah. You Okay. Yeah, um, my, I've I've never in, until you said that until you were saying that I've never really thought about this. 
but my squip experience was my drama teacher at like my after school son my after school drama club kind of thing i went to the same it's now a drama school and it does a like a b-tech course but i was there i would go on a sunday morning and learn musical theater sure um and that teacher was a, a massive influence on the person i've become um because he was he told me how it was and he said the person you are right now is very annoying he wouldn't put it exactly in those words but he he would be very direct and very truthful mm. and no one had ever been like that in my life and obviously at first i went i hate him he's horrible he's a bully but like it took me six maybe two or three years, I was about to say six months, but probably about two or three years to step back and realize, actually, he's he knows what he's doing. And he's he's truthfully telling me that the person I am right now, and I'm vict I was victimizing myself, the person I am right now is is not a good person. And I, you know, thinking back, I wouldn't be friends with who I was. Um, because I was just, I had hissy fits and I would, I would victimize myself. And I, you know, I was bullied at secondary school, but looking back, I almost, you can't blame yourself, but there were moments where I think I almost, I wouldn't say I deserved it, but I almost egged it on by victimizing myself and I made it worse. Um, so that drama teacher was a big one for me, but that, then led me on to be my own. I had a whole journey. I had a whole Be More Chill journey. Then led me on to be my own squip. And then when I left to school to go to college, which is, I don't know how to translate that to America. I, 16, I, I finished some exams at 16 and went to a different school at 17. Um, I decided I wanted to be someone totally different. And because I was moving to a new school, I was allowed to be. No one knew me. You could Before, reinvent yourself. I could reinvent myself and I did. Yeah. And um and i went a bit too far with it because i think i was allowed to become a cool kid oh. uh um and then brought myself back down and found a middle ground that's just myself now you know be, that that thing of finding yourself and being yourself um was somewhere between cool kid and uh hissy fit boy are, are you still in touch with that drama teacher who was the oh yeah what? yeah did he oh, come to be Martel? He he had booked tickets, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. So I was doing a show when Broadway shut down, and so I know that feeling of like it, it was very shocking. And mm. I am still sometimes doing the lines in my head, even though that show is never going to happen again. In that version of it, do you find yourself? Are you still singing the songs and doing the dialogue, or have you put it aside because it's so painful to not get to to yeah. know? That is still up and like yeah yeah it's it is really painful um i do go through it at night because there is i have this thing where i stay up really late not deliberately i'll lie in bed but because i haven't done much with my day my brain goes right let's think of something let's have a purpose sure. um and that purpose normally results in thinking about uh all those nights i didn't i did something odd or i did something wrong or how can i get how can i make it better what would i have done to set like when i that night I forgot my, I forgot to wear my glasses at the top of the show. And I spent the entire like 20, like maybe 10 minutes before someone was able to bring them on thinking, mm -hmm. how can I cover this? How can I get away with this? And, and hindsight, yeah. you know, you like this? <laughs> oh my God. I, I did things like, I would like, like look like I was straining until someone yeah. brought them on and they was like, I can see. Like, <laughs> it was sort of line later, but you could have had the, the squib give you glasses. Well, the thing, my, my thing was, cause I, in my head, I went, well, that, that's it. Jeremy doesn't have glasses and that's fine. And then I went, Oh God, there is a whole bit and a lighting sequence. It's not like we can just cut a line. There was lighting sequences where I take my glasses off. My vision is fixed. Uh -huh. Um, it would be a good 30 seconds of silence and a very random light sequence if we took those lines out. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I thought I have to get this in, but there was a moment, obviously hindsight is a, a great thing. Sure. But um, There was a moment that I thought, so James who played Rich says, like pretends to be nice to me and goes, oh, you've had a bad day. And I was in my, 
in my head all, all these nights I've been lying down, if I went, yeah, I forgot my glasses and like that would have got the audience on side and gone, oh, he's the actor's made a mistake and that's totally fine. Scott, you just spoke with an American accent for a moment when you did the line from the play. Yeah, of course. Um, tell us how you did, how was it to do an American accent? Had you ever had to do it before? How did people come to learn how to sound like the Be More Chill Kids? So I have had to do an American accent before and I did it horrendously. <laughs> it is on an advert that I'm not gonna say the company of. Really? Okay, I will. Orbit gum. Um, it's an Orbit gum advert. Just that I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't find it. Uh, I am the star <laughs> of this Orbit gum advert. It's called Lunch Money, and I, I, I'm, I'm pushed up against a wall, and I have to, um, I'm being bullied, and then I chew some gum, and I'm all chill, and the bully's like, I've, I've got you up against a wall. Why are you being chill? Um, but I have to speak in an American accent, and they took my braces out. They shoved six pieces of gum in my mouth and went, oh, we're going to do this in American now with no prep, no, like, with this American director breathing down my neck. I was like, oh, and it was so bad. And it's run for four years. Okay. It doesn't stop running. I'm so sorry, but I'm, I'm happy running. for the money. Oh, the money is good. Oh. <laughs> and oh you're in good company even angela lansbury with her british accent I and mean, when she's doing murder she wrote which do you know about that show the oh, uh, was it really angela bad? lansbury she's like uh, a a a, a, D, a british stage diva who moved to america she had a very big hit show in the 80s in america called murder she wrote where she played um a a main school teacher from the state of maine and she does a, a pretty good american accent throughout the whole series it's like 12 seasons 10 yeah. episodes. 20 episodes, but every now and again it'll just slip, and you're just like, "What?" Um, <laughs> something happens. So, Thank you. In in um, so Angela Lansbury has struggled. There you go. But yeah. I mean, I've seen much of your show, and you guys all sounded great. Were you trying to speak in in American off stage too, just to keep it going, or how did you handle that? I I would try not to speak off stage. That was my way of handling it because I, although I like. The method and i like to be for the two hours mm. i also get very embarrassed of this fact and so if i started speaking in american accent people would know i wanted to do that and then and then in my head laugh at me this is the whole jeremy in my head um yeah. so uh so i just did i kind of i would do actions backstage i would be like like and mouth it but in my head, I was totally doing an American accent. When you auditioned and send in your audition tape to to Joe and all of them, did you do that 12 hour audition tape with an American accent for the scenes? Yeah, yeah, okay. it was quite bad. It was. I think my American accents got better since that horrendous Orbit Gum advert four years ago or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, we had, we had um, uh, an accent coach that I actually never saw because I, it was, we always saw her in, like the cast always saw her in moments where we weren't rehearsing for our scenes. There are no scenes that Jeremy Arn isn't, isn't in. Right. So I had no time with, with the accent coach. I just had a few notes from a run like that she saw and sent an email over. So did she send you a recording to work with? No, so just, just a page of notes for mouth shape. And it was all great stuff and it helped a lot, but I yeah. would have loved to... I, I, I'm sure the reason I didn't see them was because they were happy and fine with it. Of but for course. my own sanity, yeah. I would have loved to have had someone go through every single word in the script and tell me exactly how it's supposed to sound. Because that first night, I sudden, all the things that raced through your head, I suddenly went, I haven't seen the accent coach. Like, oh my God, they're going to hate my American accent so bad. Wow. If that yeah. audience knew what was actually in your head while you were performing for them, it's kind of amazing. Yeah, I mean, there are there were definitely moments. I must say, normally, I wasn't quite into Jeremy until the squip walked on stage, and mm. and instantly the world, you're forced into that world. There's no going back. There is a man in front of you who is dressed in a long white <laughs> coat, and is is when he does that, you move. You instantly you're in it, and and obviously and also Stuart Clark, who is now an Olivier nominated actor was just phenomenal huh. and it would give you no opportunity to to for your mind to wonder to all oh, those 300 people watching me it right. was just this is jeremy and this is the script and this is the world we're in and that's 
So that not my things would race through my mind, like the glasses thing, sure. right up until Stuart Clark walked on stage, and then it was whoosh, Jeremy. Right. So he was definitely my savior for things like that. <laughs> yeah, he was my squip. So if if you were watching, know that I was thinking about everyone watching and how the props weren't quite in, in the place they're normally in right up until Stuart walked on stage. And then you watch Jeremy here. And then that squip arrives and there's no looking back. Oh. No, that no, was is, it. Is there a part of the show that um, you consistently enjoyed the most? Like, is there a moment that you just loved so much every single night getting to do? Um, yeah, I, I can tell you one that I, I liked. I can tell you one I definitely didn't. Right. Um, losing it, whatever was obviously my favorite moment in the entire show because it there was an arc that led up to it and i had to i had to think between every line because i instead of um like some actors will write the emotions that they're supposed to feel and they're supposed to show in their face and that will tell the story whereas i between every line will think the thought that inspires the sung line and so every night I would have to think those thoughts. So there was no space for me to drift, which is very useful. Um, so that's a really nice, as I say, I really enjoy that method stuff. So that was a really nice moment for me. But my least favorite was that Halloween costume. And uh, Bobby, the costume designer, I love him to pieces and I adore the show, uh, the aesthetic of the show. But that arm and the, the I, I must say I was wearing some some under undergarment I, I i was wearing a jock strap is what i was wearing there was a Perfection. yeah yeah there was, i had never worn one before because i i did ballet and i I maybe wore a yeah i think i did one but did wear one but like hand me down ones. so they were massive um didn't really fit and and then they my sizing i'm very tall and skinny so they bought me a small no. i'm not going to say any more on the matter but we no. can all just imagine how. Wait, I'm I not going to say any more on the matter. You could make a fortune auctioning that off for Broadway Cares Equity Fights Aid. So when you get back in that dressing room, <laughs> if you could hold on to that one I will. costume, do you agree, Sam? This could yeah, be. Really like, I mean, I don't think they'll be sending it to Chicago. Like, I'd say that. <laughs> I don't think they'll be, you know, I don't think Liam wants that. See, uh, sometimes it takes 53 minutes, but eventually we get into what the what yeah, the yeah. Really about. jock straps, the size of them, how they feel. This oh. is what we're all here for. Oh god. Yeah. I, I would hope that that's not the one Will Roland wore. But I mean, we'll never know. You'll never know. It's no. A, I didn't recognize the brand. It was once we went live or when we were chatting for a couple before, but you mentioned you're playing video games in yeah, quarantine. Blocks. What platform are you using? Are you the place? I'm an Xbox. I'm an Xbox boy. Xbox. All yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. I just. Uh. Yeah. I mean, PlayStation is undoubtedly better. There's. There's no. No arguing it. Okay. But I, it's just what I was when I was a kid. I mean, so I'm kind of Nintendo Switch. Switch and Nintendo Switch. On oh, that's what I wanted to do. So I was going to buy one purely because James, who plays Rich, had one, and then oh, that would make. I got one because of Gerard, who played Rich in Broadway, had one. Oh. That, I mean, he's yeah. So that's the. There should be a, a Nintendo Switch commercial starring all the riches from across yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah. Selling Nintendo Switches. Totally. Yeah. That's cool. That's quite weird, actually. Yeah, like, that is. Have you past been communicating with each other like via text thread or? Yeah, we have a we have a WhatsApp group chat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, memes are still sent. We actually still have um, uh, a Zoom, a Zoom meeting, oh. like just to just to catch up, and Same check in on each other. Um which is really nice. It's really appreciated because they don't have to do that. You know, sometimes right. it's just the cast the sometimes. when I see the screenshots of all the Broadway casts who are doing it, I'm like, eh, but I would love to see the London be more chill cast zoom uh, screenshot. Well, oh, it's it, it, sometimes it's um, because we, we it's the theater world is in a total unknown right now. Yeah. And we're all just kind of like, like what? Really? Like, yeah. I mean, we'd love to go back to work really. Like first on one hand, the creative side to just have a creative output again go back to our wonderful show that we've created and that has been formed over the last seven eight years of this show um we'd love to go back and do it but the other hand is you know i'm living with my parents i'm very lucky but some people have to pay rent yeah you know? scott i know you've been writing music uh how do people find your music uh 
Spotify and iTunes. Well, okay. I don't know if iTunes exists anymore, but Apple Music, mm -hmm. um, definitely. And it's on, I mean, every major platform you can find. Amazon Music apparently is on. Uh, um, but also I'm writing new stuff. My YouTube channel, I've managed to get everything on Good. Scott Colan. So That's you amazing. type in my name anywhere. So this video that you shot in that room where we're watching you right now, what is the name of the song? And when do we get to see that video? Well, actually that was for... Uh, that was for another exciting project. So the other palace, uh, I, having me having just worked there, approached me and said, "We're doing a hope on hope." Or I'm go I better get this right. I mean, I should get this right. right. Um, it's a song cycle uh, about songs about hope in isolation, and oh. and I am very luckily. Uh, uh, self-isolating with my girlfriend and my parents my dad being a compo musical theater composer so he has a home studio and he films and edits music videos and he writes the music for films so he has lots of experience so we just um they were expecting Kirsty and i to do a little duet live on it on youtube just like this um and we said well why don't we pre-record it and we'll shoot you a little video and they were like expecting it to be on a phone and we sent it to them and they were like what? Ah. Because my dad using his professional film camera oh, and his like lights. Oh, I wasn't. I mean, it it looks so cool. Um, and that will be out Wednesday. Okay. Wednesday on on the other palace. But I will check. I just want to check that. I call this the right thing. Um, um, the on hope song cycle. It, it starts on Wednesday, and our our video. The other palace is YouTube. I think so. I th or or they they would have set one up. But yeah, it looks like. Um, let's have a look. Did it? It's going to be like a live video, but our video will come up during the live. Also, I'll be following your social media where you'll point us towards. Yeah, it. I'll point it to it. But it's definitely on the other palace, uh, YouTube. Great. Really but also, having done that, my dad, Kirsty, and I, and my mum, who uh, does was kind of the director, um, self self proclaimed director. Uh, she when she's not at the bank. No, yeah, when she's not, well, she can't go to the bank at the moment. <laughs> but when she's not at the bank, she's um, yeah, self proclaimed director. Uh, and yeah, she, yeah, we all kind of decided we should do one of these a week because it took us six hours. We, wow. I mean, it barely made a dent in our week, in our weekend. So we wow. thought, well, we'll do one of these a week. So we're going to do one of my songs next. So definitely check out this. There you go. You got it. All right. Ask the question, Sam, before we say goodbye. To I, I think you asked the question. You, you came up with a question that's so beautiful. I'm going to let you do yeah, it. It was a tough one. Um, so, Scott, something we like to do, and you've heard the podcast, so you knew you knew it was coming. Um, but before we say goodbye and, and before I ask you the question, I cannot believe how lucky Sam and I and all the fans are to have had this time with you. In quarantine, we really need these kinds of connections and – for you to have shared so uh, much of yourself so deeply and so beautifully, we can never thank you enough. So oh, thank you for your beautiful you. work, your generous heart, and you're just an extraordinary human. So thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of the global Be More Chill community. I just have to say that before we go. Thank um, you. And now I'm going to ask you before we say goodbye to finish this sentence. Be More Chill is... The most amazing thing in the entire world. All right, I then. think that's fair. I think that's uh, amazing. Scott, thanks so much for hanging out with us. This was a dream come true. Thank I, you for having I, me. I really enjoyed it. I'm a super fan with Alana. It feels like I'm talking to a beetle right now. Totally. I got to do it for an hour, which is a dream come true. So thanks so much. Thank if you. If you are not following How to Be More Chill on Instagram, please do it at How to Be More Chill. Alana and I do not have a Twitter for it, but we do have our own Twitters. Mine is in my thing too. Yes, Broadway. Alana's is Little Known Facts podcast. Like, subscribe, comment. We will see you soon. Don't forget How to Be More Chill. Thank you for being our number one live, Sam. You got it. You did it. Bye, Scott. Bye. Bye. Bye.